Act Two of A Night Off or a Page from Balzac by Augustine Daly, Franz von Schontan, et al. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two Scene Reception Room at Damasks. A very handsome writing table, center, with desk chair in front and an easy chair nearby at left. Sofa right and chair left. Doors right and left. Window right center. Time the following afternoon. Damask, in handsome house jacket and cap, is discovered at desk writing. He finishes, rings bell, folds paper. Maria enters at center. Damask, giving her the paper. Take that to Mrs. Dedeleaves as quick as you can. It's a prescription. Tell her she'll find full directions inside. Maria takes letter and exits center and left. I'm afraid my wife needs a prescription more than anybody. She went to bed with a headache last night, had breakfast sent up to her this morning, kept her room at lunchtime, and has been speechless to me all the while, and all because I have no past. Was anything ever so ridiculous? It's a bad case. I really believe I must have a consultation over it. Maria, center from left, enters with her hat and shawl on, and with a card on a tray. A gentleman called, just as I was going out, sir. Damask, right, reads. Alfred Chumley, with Snap's dramatic combination. Shakes his head. Don't know him. If you please, sir, he wrote something on the other side. Oh? Did he? Turns card and reads. Behind the unsuggestive alias of Chumley is concealed the identity of your old college chum, Jack Mulberry. Jack Mulberry. To Maria. Show him in at once. She exits. He reads. Who, remembering the pleasant days we spent together as students at Leipzig, asks your friendly aid in a matter of importance. Jack enters, center from left. Old fellow. Jack, old boy, is it possible you are an actor and in America? Shake hands, then they embrace. Transformation, isn't it? The idle drone in the hive of learning turned industrious worker in the flowery garden of the drama. Behold me, leading juvenile, eccentric comedian, light very light tenor in comic opera with Snap's Central Park dramatic menagerie. But, my dear boy, with your family, your prospects, what brought you to it? The path that leads to all folly, the thorny path of love and recklessness. You recollect I was always in love. I remember our Hebrew professor's daughter. We exchanged sighs, Glances, smiles, letters, and vows of love for several months. You had got as far as that when I left the university. And I stopped there. It appears I was only tenant at will of her heart, subject to a month's notice to quit. I was ejected. Our Greek tutor moved in with a lease for life. That is, she married him. So far, all's well. Worse remains behind. I went home, completed my education in London with a finishing course of fast life, and ended by falling at the feet of a charming little serio-comic singer at the Canterbury. You idle fellows are all of a piece. I really am not surprised now at my wife. She takes us to be all alike. How did you get out of this scrape? I didn't get out of it. That's what I'm here for. You can help me. Excuse me. I decline to interfere in these irregularities. My dear old Socrates, you misunderstand. The irregularity is all over. You are sure? Turned over a new leaf, spanked Cupid, and turned him out of my house, closed the books, made up my accounts, and am ready to submit them to your inspection with the proper vouchers. Will you listen? Certainly. Both sit. Jack pulls a Russia leather pocketbook from his pocket. To begin, the little Queen of Canterbury was a charming creature. 
The proof of the fact is contained in Exhibit A, a portrait. Damask takes it. Extremely pretty. Eyes of heavenly blue, tresses of raven blackness. Exhibit B, tress of raven blackness. Hands over a small black curl, tied with pink ribbon. Damask takes it. Well? We became acquainted on a beautiful summer evening, and as a proof of her maidenly attachment, she presented me with a rose. Exhibit C, remains of rose. Hands over a crushed rosebud. Very appropriate. Takes it. When we pledged our undying attachment, she gave me, in eternal remembrance, a little ring of twisted gold. Exhibit D. Takes out ring and polishes it on his sleeve. Looks like gold, doesn't it? The whole thing suggests unmitigated brass. So far, all is mere trifling. What oppresses me most is Exhibit E. Draws from his book a package of bills. Take them. Turns away as he hands them over and puts his hand to his eyes. Unpaid? Looks over the package. Mostly. They were the cause of our separation. The governor refused to send me any more money. It affected her so deeply that she wrote to me that we must part, that she was resolved to bury herself from the world. I subsequently learned that she had died Exhibit B. Takes up curl. As yellow as Exhibit D. Shows ring. And was playing Boccaccio in Dublin. Rises, crosses to right. In Dublin? That was hard. And you drove her to it? You can imagine the rest. Remorse drove me to New York. I pawned my gold watch. Stop a minute. Here's the ticket. Exhibit F. Pawn ticket for watch. Shows it, then replaces it and the rest of the articles in the pocketbook, which he hands to Damask. And then I went on the stage. I hadn't a particle of talent for it, of course, but I joined a bread-and-butter company and go through the country for my board when I can get it. But now I'm sick and tired of the whole business. I wish to go home like the prodigal and ask my good-hearted dad for pardon. So far he has sent back my letters unopened, but he thinks the world of you, for you were the best and soberest of all my college friends. So, if you will only write to him... Damask taking his hand. Certainly. I'll do it at once. I'll send him all these documents with a strong personal letter, and if you will add a few lines of contrition at the end, you'll be sure of forgiveness. Puts the articles in pocketbook and locks it up in his desk. Both rise. I saw by the morning paper that my governor has just arrived in New York, so we'll set about it today. I'll get the name of his hotel, and you can write at once to him. Today? Angelica enters at right. My dear, I'm delighted to see you down. Allow me. Introducing. An old friend of my college days. You've often heard me speak of Jack Mulberry? Quite so. Charmed, I'm sure. An old friend of my husband's, and from such a distance. Gives her hand. Quite interesting. His chum at college. To Damask. My love. With a sweet smile. Yes, dear? I left my century on the table in my room. Won't you send it to Mama for me? Certainly, my love. To Jack. See you in a few moments, Jack. Exit right. Angelica aside. You shall give me the facts about my gentleman's past. You must consider our house your own while you stay here, Mr. Mulberry. My husband will want to talk over old times with you. Sits on sofa, right. Oh, I shall be delighted, but... Angelica, not heeding. Oh, he has told me all about them. Such stories, such adventures. Well, according to his own account, he was the wildest among you. Jack, aside. Harry's been romancing to the confiding soul. I suppose he led you off now and then. 
Well, yes, that is, now and then. Yes, when he didn't go it too strong. Oh, I always love to hear him tell about it. Then he didn't exaggerate when he told me he was dubbed the Heartbreaker. Jack, aside. Heartbreaker. Poor Harry. Meek as a mouse. If she's so proud of it, I suppose I'd better humour the fancy. You don't answer. Oh, he was right. His adventures would fill volumes. Angelica rises, aside in agony. Oh, heavens! Really? I'm so glad. I thank you very much for your information. Gives her hand and turns away. Jack aside. Something's wrong here. I think I'd better go before I commit Harry further. If you will permit me, a very pressing engagement. Gets his hat. Must you? I must. There's no telling what might be the consequences if I didn't. Aside. She looks like Cassandra. Say to Harry that I'll run in again presently. Angelica aside. He did have a past after all. She is looking away from him and intently at the door right. Eh? Oh? Aside. The lady seems to be holding an animated conversation with herself. Just say to Harry, eh? Yes, exactly. Ahem. Good morning. Exits hurriedly, center and left. Angelica to and fro with an outburst. It is true, then. Now he must confess, confess all. Damask re-enters right. Here's the magazine, dear. But Maria went out for me and hasn't gotten back yet. Looks around. Where's Jack? Never mind, Jack. Damask looks at her. W what's the matter? Because I didn't send the magazine? Never mind the magazine. Couldn't you see it was a pretext to get rid of you while I questioned your friend about your past life? Damask stares at her and then slams the magazine down in a pet. Well, of all the insanities... Hush, sir. You would tell me nothing. I had to apply to him. My dear, this is monomania. You are getting in a very bad way. I thought at first you were only joking, but now... Flings himself into chair. At first I was only joking, but I thought it over and over last night, and this morning it has become a sad conviction. Goes to him and puts her hand on his shoulder lovingly. If you would only understand me, I am not so childish as to be jealous of your path. He moves chair round so as to face her and regards her with a puzzled look. But I love you too much to be satisfied with the part some women assume towards their husband's inner self. He rises. She places her arms around his neck. I wish to be your friend, your confidant. And it is therefore my right to know every secret of your heart. Sobbing. <laughs> I, I never conceal anything from you. Damask takes her hands from his neck and holds them. But if I haven't any secrets? Harry, open your heart to me. I would willingly if I could. Oh, Harry, do it. He impatiently passes her. I have watched you when you thought you were alone, have seen you gazing into vacancy. He turns away his head to conceal his amusement. As if some... Dark memory oppressed you, just as you look now. He shakes with silent laughter. You are moved. I see, I feel it. Oh, it is impossible that the life of a man like you should never have been stirred by the upheaval of some volcanic passion. Tell me, tell me, please do. Falls on his neck. Damask turns his face to her with affected solemnity. Will you promise, solemnly promise, never to revert to the topic again if I comply with your wish? I promise solemnly. On that condition, I will tell you the story. Yes, yes. Damask looks at her. And you will forgive me everything? Everything. Well, then. 
He goes to his desk center and unlocks his drawer. She sinks into chair nearby, riveted. He takes out Jack's pocketbook. Listen. Angelica, aside. At last. Damask, after a moment's pause and holding the pocketbook in his hand. While I was a student at Leipzig, I ran on now and then to Paris and plunged into the gaieties of the capital. I was a constant attendant at the Café Chartant in the Champs-Élysées. Now you see, you never told me that before. Jumps up and kisses him. Oh, you darling. Sits left of table. I made the acquaintance of one of the most distinguished prima donnas of the period. Here is the picture. Takes photo out of the book and hands it to her. Angelica looks at it, sets her lips firmly, stiffens up. <sighs> Sighs, shakes her head, and then in low tone. And you loved her? To distraction. She gave me a rose. This one. Hands it over. Angelica lets her hands fall in her lap contemplatively. And when I passionately asked her for greater proofs of affection, she cut off a tress of her silken hair. Take it. Angelica takes it, eyes it critically, holding it up daintily. Well? Yes, there is more to come. In the intoxication of my wild infatuation, I gave her a gold ring. Angelica starts. But I got it back again. Here it is. Angelica taking it. Of course you smothered her with presents. Oh, awfully. And ran madly into debt. Unfortunately. Here are the bills. Gives them. Mostly unpaid. Finally, I pawned my grandfather's watch. Here's the ticket. Gives it and rises. And now you know all. Angelica rises reflectively. And this happened... Counts on her fingers. Five years ago. Does it worry you now? Puts all the things back into the pocketbook and lays book on table. Damask sighs. It does oppress me, but gone is gone. Angelica comes to him. And the sequel? Lays her head on his shoulder. Haven't you got enough? What became of her? Poor girl. She took the veil. And her relatives? Had she nobody? Damask, puzzled, scratches his head. Oh, yes. An uncle. Angelica, right, stepping back a step. He called you to account. He challenged you. Oh, yes. He gave me no end of trouble. He was bloodthirsty to a degree. And you have borne all this in silence so long. Harry, I love you. Throws her arms about him. I worship you. Nisby enters center from left, sees the picture, laughs, and calls off. Mama, hurry! A picture of domestic bliss. Mrs. Babbitt enters center from left. What is it? Damask aside to Angelica as she starts away. Don't tell your mother a word of all this. Never! Goes to Mrs. Babbitt as Damask greets Nisby. Oh, Mama, I'm so delighted to see you. Draws her down and impressively aside. Come to my room. I've something most important to tell you. Mrs. Babbitt, same. Very well. They separate. Damask crosses to Mrs. Babbitt. Well, Mama, was I not right to advise the springs? You look ten years younger. You're more of a flatterer than a physician, I'm afraid. I'm not at all well. Dear me. Talks with her. Angelica, upright center to Nisby. Keep Harry here while I take Mama to my room. I understand. Takes off her hat, etc. Mrs. Babbitt crosses to left center, upstage. Angelica, how is your parrot? He's in my room. He's learned ever so many words since you were here last. Yes, pick them up from us. He says, kiss me, darling, all day long. He got that from Angelica. Oh, I must hear him say that. Angelica, aside to her. Stay where you are. Come, Mama. 
Nisby crosses to Damask. I want to hear him say, Kiss me, darling. Damask crosses to right center, darting to door. I'll fetch him. Angelica takes up pocketbook from table center. What for? We can go to him just as well. Motions to Nisby. Come, Mama. Rye exits quickly with Mrs. Babbitt. We all go. Nisby detains him. Oh, Harry, I want to ask you something. He turns at the door. She goes to him. Not just yet. Aside. I think I hear them going over Exhibit A now. Nisby left, linking his arm. Yes, yes, it's very important. Do be quick as possible, then. Glares off, right. Nisby brings him down. Since our return from the springs, I've had several strange attacks. Yes, yes, all right. Aside, looking right. She's telling her mother everything. Nisby lets go his arm. You're not listening. Yes, I am. Go on. Nisby, extending her arm. Feel my pulse. Don't you notice anything? Damask, looking off right and grasping her thumb by mistake. No. Nisby draws thumb away indignantly. After I get up in the morning and have my breakfast. Gulps. Well, what then? Then there's nothing. But after breakfast, I go out for a walk for about half an hour. Well, if walking for a half an hour doesn't agree with you, stay at home for half an hour. But it does agree with me. All right, go then. Going. Nisby holding him back. But something strange happened in my walk this morning. I saw some roses. Damask aside. Roses. Exhibit C. Let me go. I must see Angelica. Nisby holds him. Near the roses stood a young man. Damask turns and looks at her. I didn't take any notice of him. Gulps. But at the mere sight of the roses, I suddenly grew dizzy. My heart began to palpitate. Everything grew black, as if I were going to faint. Sinks into chair. Faint? I'll get you something. Darts off right down. No, no, stay here. It's coming over me again. Oh, oh. Sinks in chair, pretending to faint. Short pause. Looks up cautiously, and finding herself alone, bounds up. He got away after all that. Well, I did the best I could for Angie, the heartless monster, to leave me in a fainting condition. Jack coughs outside. Nisby listens. No, he's coming back. Now I'll give him a swoon as is a swoon. Throws herself in a chair, closes her eyes, and groans. Oh, oh, oh. Jack enters center from left with a note. I've jotted down a few more points for Harry in writing this letter. Sees Nisby. What's that? A young lady? Seems to be ill. Nisby, her eyes still closed. Rolls her head languidly. Oh! Oh! Jack looks around. If I could find the cologne. Sees an atomizer on the table. Here's something. Takes it up and squeezes the cologne over her face. Nisby groans feebly with her eyes still closed. Oh, how refreshing! Do it some more. Jack aside. By Jove, she's pretty. Repeats business. Nisby saying, Bathe my forehead. Jack Wright looks around. Where's the water? Not finding it, resumes the atomizer. That's it. Now a little back of my ears. Jack obeys. Oh, how reviving. Do you feel better now? Nisby opens her eyes suddenly, then starts up. A stranger? Heavens! Pardon me if I startled you, but I thought it my duty to come to your assistance. I'm so much obliged, but I, I thought it was my brother-in-law. I am too happy in having arrived at the right moment, especially as my medical knowledge. Unconsciously squeezes the atomizer and gets the cologne in his eyes. Are you a doctor too? 
Not exactly, but I studied medicine for one term with my friend Harry. My name is Jack Mulberry. Dr. Damask is my brother-in-law. Then I have the pleasure of addressing the professor's daughter. Yes, but don't tell Papa of my fainting, please. I wouldn't dream of it for the world. Besides, I perceived at once that you were merely practicing a little deception on somebody. Practicing a deception? Of course. You recovered too suddenly. Allow me. It was very serious. I have these attacks repeatedly. Jack aside. The little fibber. If you understand anything about medicine, you must perceive that I have a fever. Be kind enough to feel my pulse. She holds out her hand, the thumb uppermost. As Jack advances to feel her pulse, she turns the thumb down. Certainly a very strong fever. Not a trace. There now. I offer my humblest apologies. I begin to see your case clearly. Before these attacks come on, you have a buzzing in your ears? She nods. A mist comes over your eyes? She nods. Hammering in your head? Same business. Twitching sensation in your hands? Same business. One foot cold as ice, the other burning hot? Yes, yes. What do you advise? You wish to know? Yes, I'm prepared for anything. Well then, I advise you to invent some other illness. What? Or devote more care to the statement of your symptoms. Do you mean to... I mean to say that the condition you described never existed, except in the imagination. You should have taken another course of lessons, Doctor. You never got as far as my complaint. Possibly, possibly, and I never regretted so much as now that I rejected science to go on the stage. Are you an actor? Well, some people think I'm not. Fact is, I merely imagined I could be one. Having discovered my mistake, I gave it up cheerfully. My last appearance will be as Cassius, a young Roman in your father's tragedy. Father's tragedy? Papa has written a tragedy? Jack, aside. She doesn't know it. How awkward of me. And it's going to be produced? I ought not to have mentioned it. Oh, yes, you ought. And you must tell me all about it. I'm burning to know. No, no. We are pledged to secrecy, and it slipped out. Mutters to himself, aside. Nisby, aside. More mystery about Papa. That accounts for the portrait and the soda water at the opera house. Now I think of it, the piece is not by your father, but by some other professor's daughter's father. I got the names confused. I do believe he can fib like a girl. We'll see. Oh yes, I know what you mean now. It's that old tragedy they found in the college library. Eyes him keenly. Oh, yes. Found it in an old chest in the cellar. Yes, that's the very one. The plot is all about the persecutions of the early Christians. Under Numa Pompilus. You've got it. I play Cassius. I'm an early Christian. They persecute me. But don't tell your papa. Promise me. No, I won't. But you must promise me something, too. With pleasure. What? Invent some other plot for your next tragedy. What? Or pay more attention to your historical dates. Just imagine. Persecutions of the Christians under Numa Pompilus. Why, he died 700 years before the Christian era. Horrible. I forgot I was talking to a professor's daughter. I apologize again. Seems to me I'm always apologizing. Don't worry. We're quits now for my fainting spell. And I'm forgiven? Fully. Oh, thanks. He is about to take her hand when the professor enters center from left. The author of her being and of the play. Professor aside. Or leading juvenile. What are you doing here? I, I have a letter for Dr. Damask. Indeed. 
I wonder if these fellows make love off the stage as well as they do on it. My brother-in-law's in the next room. Is he? Well, then, I'll take my leave. Bows, going, aside. She's lovely and she's clever. My first encounter with one of the institutions of the country. An American girl. I hope I'll see more of it. Exits center and left. Nisby Wright brings Professor down. Papa, I think it's very unfair to have secrets from me. What secrets? You know I always stand by you. Oh, well, then. I know all. You have written a tragedy. For goodness sake, not so loud. If your mother should hear, only think. She hasn't spoken a kind word to me since she got back from the springs. How did we find you when we did get back? Has she spoken to you about it? Not a syllable. She's a dreadfully uncomfortable woman. She keeps things for days, leaves you in an awful state of apprehension, and then springs at you when you least expect it. Do me one favor. Don't leave me alone with her any more than you possibly can. Nisby, in thought. Papa, is Cassius a nice part? Cassius? Oh, of course he is. He's the hero. Has a magnificent love scene in the second act. Stabs himself in the third. Doesn't he come in after the third act? How can he, after stabbing himself? I think the interest will flag, then. It's a great pity. No, it won't. Rubs his hands. I saw the rehearsal this morning. How did you like it? I don't know. I was so excited it seemed like a dream. Aren't you awfully nervous? I didn't sleep a wink last night. Tell me, Papa, whom does Cassius make love to? Mrs. Babbitt enters right down, carrying the pocketbook and bills in her hand. The professor avoids her. Shush! Here's your mother. Miss Be. Icy tones as she sees the professor. Oh, you're here. Professor crosses, yet avoiding her eye. Yes, my love. You see, I couldn't deny myself the pleasure of calling for you. Indeed. Nisby, go to your sister. She wants you. Nisby crosses to the professor, who has gesticulated violently, pantomiming her to stay. Oh, Mama, just as I was having such a nice talk with Papa, whom I haven't seen for so long. No, we haven't seen each other for so long. Continues his motions. I wish to speak with your father alone. Sits left. That settles it. Sinks into chair right of table. Now for it. Nisby aside. Poor Papa. Going and aside to him. Cheer up. Exits right down. Professor aside as Mrs. Babbitt turns on him. The juggernaut approaches. You are aware, Mr. Babbitt, that you owe me some explanations. Professor rises confidently, clearing his throat. I'm quite ready, my dear. Mrs. Babbitt repressing him by an imperious wave of the hand. You are quite ready with a tissue of inventions, no doubt. Now, my darling... I spare you the trouble. There is something, unfortunately, of graver importance. I must have at least five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars? Aghast. At once. Will you please explain? No. I forego explanations from you and reserve all on my own part. Get me the money. The matter admits of no delay. But where am I to get it? Take it out of Nisby's money. Professor, aside. Mm, and I've just borrowed from Nisby's money to meet some expenses at the... What are you saying? 
You wouldn't have me touch the child's pittance. We can save up and replace it in a year. Give me the key of the safe. She'll find I've been there already. Well? The fact is, my darling, I've just had to call in her investment and happened to have the money with me. I just got it from the bank. Fumbles in his pocket. All the better. Holds out her hand. Professor takes out pocketbook and produces a single bank bill. My beautiful fresh greenback. Hands it. Mrs. Babbitt snatching it. Five hundred dollars all in one bill. Examines it. Yes. You nearly made it in two. That's how it goes so easily. My last cent. And tomorrow the first of the month. Angelica and Damask enter right. He is sulky and keeps his hands in his pockets. She is clinging to one arm sweetly. Angelica aside to Damask as they enter. Will you see that my telling her was all for the best? Good morning, Professor. Struck by his dejected air. Oh, you don't look well. Anything the matter? Professor stretches out his hand gloomily to shake. Damask takes hold of his pulse and pulls out his watch to count. Professor snatches his hand away. Damask shrugs his shoulders and they separate. Mrs. Babbitt draws Angelica down front and gives her the banknote and the pocketbook cautiously. There are five hundred dollars to pay your husband's sinful debts. Oh, Mama. No, thanks. Thank goodness I had it. Oh, Mama, how good you are. Tries to embrace her. Mrs. Babbitt draws back. Hush. Crosses to Professor. Are you going to be at home this evening, Mr. Babbitt? Professor, injured tone and look. Do I ever go out? Yes, for soda water. He retires upstage. She follows him. Angelica Wright beckons Damask down to her, gives him the pocketbook and the bank bill. Now you see how much better it was to confess everything to me? There are five hundred dollars. Pay those dreadful debts and close the transaction forever. Damask, surprised and amused. What? Five hundred? Hush! It's a little torn, but... You are an angel. Tries to embrace her. She draws back, her fingers to her lips, and joins her mother. They hurry off, right, in animated conversation. Come, Mama. Nisby's waiting. Exit with Mrs. Babbitt right down. Damask looks at banknote. Providence takes care of its own. Pockets money and locks pocketbook in drawer. If it pays as well as this, I'll tell her a few more anecdotes of my past life. Sits right up table. Professor, who has walked the stage dolefully, stops and eyes Damask. Shall I try and raise the money for my son-in-law? He never seems to have any surplus change, but here goes. Comes down. Will you have a cigar, Harry? I just bought some. Takes a paper parcel from his pocket, unwraps it, and produces two cigars. The poor old gentleman's favorite. Key West's. I couldn't rob you, sir. Smoke one with me. Offers cigars from Case. I dare say yours are the best. Wraps his own up again and pockets them. Takes a cigar from Damask and gets a match from his pocket as Damask takes out his match case. No, no. I'll furnish the matches. Fair play, you know. They light. Professor holding the match burns his fingers. He eyes Damask. You don't smoke. The fact is, Harry, I'm in a little trouble. I want to ask a favor of you. Certainly, sir. What is it? Could you help me out with a little money for a few months? Damask, smoking. With pleasure. Really? 
Damask, feeling in his pocket. How much? It's a very large sum. Don't hesitate to name it. Anything in reason. Oh, five hundred dollars. Mere trifle. Turns half away, unfolds banknote, while the professor looks on excitedly. Here you are. Harry, you're a noble fellow. You don't mind its being one bill, I suppose? Hands it over. One bill? Opens it aside. My bill. He swindled it out of my wife, the young robber. Pockets it. Well... He'll never get that back again. Snap enters hurriedly at back, sees the professor, and comes forward. Thank goodness I found you at last. I've come straight from your house. Puts down his hat and produces manuscripts of the play. What do you want here? Go away. Points vigorously to Damask. Damask smoking. Ah, Snap. To Professor... I hope you're not to back up Snap with my five hundred. Snap, smiling to Damask. How'd you do, sir? To Professor. Oh, I made the doctor's acquaintance this morning. He took two seats for the opening. Crossing to Santa inquiringly, half aside. Does he know? No, he does not. But he'd be glad to. What is it? Snap puts a finger beside his nose. Professor crosses to center, to Damask hurriedly. I rely on your discretion. He comes about my play, my tragedy. It's going to be played in the strictest confidence. By Jove! Good! I admire your pluck, Dad-in-law. Professor to snap. Now, what is it? You had no business to come here. My wife may be in at any moment. Oh, if we're caught, we can pass it off with a little presence of mind. Say that I'm an old friend of yours, or a stranger visiting the university. I think on the whole we'd better not rely on our presence of mind. Your absence of body would be better. But what do you want? Snap recalled to business. Oh, just so opens the manuscripts. It's about the part of Tulia, the female slave, you know. We haven't a soul to play it. No one to play Tulia? Why, she's one of the principal parts of the piece. She gives it its name. She's the beautiful Sabine. What's it to be done? I've talked it over with my wife. That woman is invaluable for expedience. You couldn't corner that woman if you were Shakespeare himself. She found a way out of the difficulty immediately. Instead of Tulia, a female slave, we make it Tullius, a male slave, and there you are. It's impossible. I can't make her a male slave. Remember her soliloquy in the first act. Ah, oh, that I were a that I were a man. You can't have a man speak that. True. The subtle significance of the aspiration would be lost. Well, then. Well, then. If we can't make her a man, and we haven't got a woman, there's only one thing left. We make it a child, see? Oh, that I were that I were a man, which she isn't, and there you are. A child? No, I won't submit to have the part cut down like that. It'll add to the piece immensely. My youngest boy, Tom, will take the part and make it the hit of the performance. You really think it would do? I should say so. That child of mine is a born genius. Just go over the lines, won't you, and cut out the long words. I've brought the book. You want me to alter all the part on the spot? Must. We rehearse again tonight. Oh, then come with me. 
Harry, keep everybody out of this room. Exits left, down, with manuscripts. Very good, Professor. Sees him off and returns. Uh, by the way, Doctor, my wife's heard about your wife's parrot, and she's dying to bring it on in the beautiful Sabine. Is there a parrot in the play? No, no. But the second act is set in a grove of pines, and she thought it would look realistic to have the parrot discovered on one of the pine trees. Bit of realism, see? These things take immensely. Have you got a pine tree? Not exactly a pine tree, but my wife has hit on a capital substitute. She saw an orange plant in a tub at the drug store and got the loan of it for the run of the play. We give the druggist the line on the bills for its use. Just fancy, a live parrot on a real orange tree. The audience would be transported to Rome in an instant. Why, old man, you're going to make a regular spectacle of it. How about your costumes? Got a full Roman wardrobe? I should say so. My wife made them all for the La Belle Helene. Crosses to left, stops, and rubs his ear. There was a hitch, though, at one time. We hadn't anything for the Sabine warriors to wear. And how did you manage? My wife did it. When we went to sleep last night, there were all the Sabine warriors before our mind's eye without a rag on. In the middle of the night, just as I was dreaming of the hundredth performance of the piece, she gave a scream that nearly threw me out of bed. I have it, she cried. And she had. We are going to have a company of firemen for the Sabine army, you know. Well, we make them wear their red shirts outside with tights, and there you are. Damask throws himself into chair, laughing. Ha, 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 the Sabine army in red shirts. I believe the effect will be striking. It will be. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Snap, you are the prince of barnstormers. Barnstormers. Who were the first actors? Barnstormers. Who was Roseus? A barnstormer. Or Garrick. Or Keen. Barnstormers. Perhaps I don't always pay my salaries and can't always take my trunks away, but all the more glory for getting on in spite of it. Where's your school for genius? We have it. Who, in his time, plays many parts? We do. Barnstormers, indeed. Barnstormers. Exits in high indignation after the professor. Bravo, Snap. I like a man to stand up for his trade. Mrs. Babbitt re-enters right down. You seem in remarkably good spirits. Damask instantly becomes grave. She looks around. I thought I heard high words. You didn't expect to hear low language, I hope. This is no time for trifling, Henry. My daughter has told me everything. In spite of my express injunctions. It was her duty as my child. And what was her duty as my wife? How can you talk of duty after the revelations you have made? Damask aside. I'm afraid we've made a nice mess after all. You perceive that I do not use violent reproaches. I will even shield you. Angelica's father shall know nothing. That being the case, let's say no more about it. It's a subject that will not bear discussion. I shall simply act. He looks at her. I will take the settlement of this affair into my own hands. I don't quite understand. I doubt if there is another mother-in-law who would act with so much dignity and tact. No, it's remarkable. I only require from you the whole truth. First of all, about that unfortunate girl. Is everything over between you? Forever. That is satisfactory as far as it goes. Next, as to those shameful debts. You must pay them instantly. Has Angelica given you the money? 
Yes. But it's gone. Gone? I, I mean gone by mail. I paid the bills on the spot. Oh, I'm glad you have had that sense of honor. And now to the most important point. Is there another point? Mrs. Babbitt intently, leaning forward. The uncle. What uncle? The uncle who called you to account for the fate of his niece. Oh, oh, he's all right. He'll cool down. Aside. What a mess of rubbish I made up. I cannot believe it. My child's happiness is at stake, and that man must be conciliated. But my dear Mrs. Babbitt... Don't try to put me off. My resolve is taken. I must communicate with that man and entreat his pardon for the sake of my innocent daughter whom you have married. It's not at all necessary. I beg you won't feel the slightest uneasiness. Mrs. Babbitt, shaking her head obdurately. I shall write him this very night. Give me his address. Damask laughed aside. Here's a pretty kettle of fish. I cannot give you his address. Why not? I don't know it. His last address? He's changed it. He skips about from place to place. He is searching for you. What nonsense. I assure you, he's quite satisfied. As long as the bills are paid, he'll let up. How will he know that the bills are paid? Oh, Lord. I shall tell him. You don't know his address. I didn't say I would write to him. I said I would tell him. You know where to find him? Damask, exhausted. No. The fact is, I have told him. He has been here? Quite. Casually. Traveling to see the university. I have a dreadful apprehension. Those high words I heard just before I entered. No, no, we parted on the best of terms. You assure me sacredly that you are reconciled. Sacredly. Mrs. Babbitt, hand to her heart. Oh, what a relief. Go instantly and reassure your wife. You don't know in what a state I left her. Sing, sing to chair. I can imagine. Aside, going. Meddling gold. Confound it. It's my own fault. I'll never play another joke as long as I live. Exits right in temper. Mrs. Babbitt looks after him. I believe he is truly repentant. Goes to door right and listens. If he is only kind to Angelica. Snap re-enters left with manuscripts, followed by the professor rubbing his hands. He perceives Mrs. Babbitt instantly. My wife! Great Scott! Runs off left. His wife! Tries to steal toward door center. Mrs. Babbitt, right, rises, turns, and sees him. A stranger! He stops awkwardly. Who are you? What are you doing? Nothing. Nothing in particular, my dear madam. Mrs. Babbitt, I believe? Are you looking for my husband? No. No, not at all. Or oh, the doctor? Shall I call him? Pray don't. I don't want the doctor. I'm quite well, thank goodness. I've had enough of the doctor. You... you have seen my son-in-law, then? Yes, it's all right. I bear no malice. Aside. Barnstormers, indeed. Mrs. Babbitt, aside and in alarm. No malice? Good heavens, can it be the uncle? You, you are a stranger. Yes, a traveler. Stopped over to see the university. Mrs. Babbitt, aside. It is he. Snap, trying to escape. I wish you good morning. Stop! Concealment is useless. I know your business here. Before you go, you and I must have an explanation. Snap, aside. She wants to get the play back. Puts manuscripts in his breast pocket and buttons up. Not if I know it. Mrs. Babbitt approaching with sympathy. I know all. Well, if you know all, you know that things have gone too far to have any fooling now. Mrs. Babbitt draws him gently forward. No one, no one sympathizes with your poor niece more than I do. Niece? 
i have no niece no because you heartlessly cast her off gad it's a regular play strikes an attitude ay i cast her off what then aside i'll let her play it out folds his arms and gazes at her and you have come to seek satisfaction from my son-in-law eh oh have i and i'll get it too barnstormers <laughs> what would you strikes a gloomy attitude he has wronged you in my tenderest point oh how you must have suffered when the convent gates closed upon that broken-hearted child snap pretends to be shaken with emotion and aside turning from her it's a regular seaside library dramatized she's given me the cue though that young villain to deceive a broken-hearted girl i'll pile some more on him aloud and a la iago you don't know all have you courage i am his mother-in-law the niece was not his only victim great heavens go on poor poor camille handkerchief to eyes i shudder at your words one day the old man came home the girl's father i mean he came home to to dinner mrs babbitt drops into chair it was too late they had flown leaving a note upon his empty plate and the end the end for years that wronged father pursued the search for his only camille at length he found his child in wretched lodgings abandoned to the care of pampered menials the ruffian had deserted her his paltry reason her want of grammar mrs babbitt rises the upstart it is just like him damask re-enters with angelica wright so sir the deuce tries to bolt mrs babbitt holds him by jove tries to push angelica off again this is no place for you stay where you are i have had an interview with the uncle he has told me all what snap aside how clever of him to take the part at a moment's notice crosses to him my dear sir i owe you more than i can pay i'm afraid you do so sir there was another victim mamma coming forward another victim another vic drops snap's hand he has revealed to me the full measure of your wickedness oh henry what have you done with camille ah camille camille to snap you mother camille ah! damask rushes to catch angelica mrs babbitt interposes and waves him off monster damask now makes a dart after snap who has stood above laughing the latter rushes for door as the curtain falls end of act two